yeah, I think that we can, without further ado, we can kind of break this down and keep on going. So welcome, my name is Andy. For those of you that, that don't know me, I've been a designer of all sorts. I've started off as a UI designer over a decade ago. Then I moved over to kind of UX design, then service design. Uh, and then I became, um, is it my phone? No, it's not. Um, and then I became a, a leader at, you know, um, at, at, at the company previously that I was employed at Deloitte Digital. Some of you might might heard about it. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a big four, kind of a big consulting firm. And I was a head of service design over there. And um, yeah, and now I'm kind of, um, you know, doing my own uh, my own thing, which I'm really glad to, that, that I'm, you know, blessed enough to, to be able to do that. And um, yeah, today I wanted to show you the the mural app, the, the one of the tools that we use currently very, very heavily when it comes to our online remote work uh, with, with our clients, with, with, with their teams and how we kind of facilitate those things together. So um, yeah, let's cover it. So when, 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 when it comes to kind of using murals, mural itself, if you go to, um, if you go to mural, .co, you'll be able to kind of get access to the actual app. So for those of you, for those of you that want kind of, um, you know, an immediate access, I'm going to type that into the chat so you know well, what's what. Um, and definitely, you know, after we're done with the webinar, you can you, you can get out there and kind of, I think that they've got like a, a 90 day free deal that you can get access to the tool and actually start using it. So we've been using it quite heavily uh, recently due to this, to this whole Corona madness. But beforehand, I mean, before the, the whole, the, the whole uh, lockdown happened, we've been actually using the tool for like a year, year and a half now. And, uh, you know, we've got quite a, quite a few learnings um, on the basis of that. So, when it comes to, to the tool itself, um, I'm going to go back a little bit to, to the main screen with, with all of our uh, canvases. This is one of the kind of rooms that you're able to create. I've created a 99 Grid Academy Design Thinking uh, Bootcamp. Um, it's BHS, it's Business Hypothesis Mapping Room specific for our trainings online. And you can create multiple different rooms uh, and you, they can either be open rooms or they can be private rooms themselves. I I've, I've actually have a, an open room uh, and when you log into Mural, this is what you're going to see without all the canvases, obviously. But uh, this is what you'll see uh, as an empty kind of um, an empty dashboard. So I'm going to go to Design Thinking at Night, an open room we've created some time ago. And all we need to do now is basically create a new mural. And when you click this whole plus plus sign or plus button over here, it's going to come up with a with a kind of um, you know a, an interface uh, so that we can actually kind of browse through multiple different templates. You've got like team warm-ups, planning. Uh, a lot of different templates are available to us, you know, when we actually use it. But to be honest with you guys, I rarely use these pre-made templates. I prefer to kind of come up with those kind of templates on my own and, and make sure that I kind of leverage uh, the capabilities of the tool themselves rather than using these pre-made templates because there's always something missing. There's always something wrong with them. Uh, you know, that you just need that little twist to them. They sometimes are a good starting point to start with, but Usually, I just go with a blank mural and then I'm open to do whatever I want. And that's what I wanted to do today. Um, and obviously, you can browse by categories and types as well. But I just wanted to open up a blank mural. All we need to do is just click Create Mural and off we go. And we are, uh, it's generating our mural and we are in. So this is the blank mural. And, and there's a few things to consider to start with. The first one is obviously the title of this mural. So I'm going to just, if you click anywhere over here, uh, it's going to click, uh, it's going to, Put that into your edit so i'm, I'm going to type in design thinking at night and we're going to go with uh 30th of april right uh 2020 so that's that if you click off it it's going to kind of save whatever we've written there and uh, there's a little drop down here with additional options and we will get into that very very shortly uh, when it comes to, you can add this mural to favorites, you can share it, export it, etc. But there's one particular um, option that I wanted to cover with this specific thing. But before before we get that, I just wanted to cover the entire layout. So, so this is the the mural itself. Um, on the right hand right hand side at the very bottom, we've got this um, these zoom settings. So this kind of shows us the entire size of the canvas itself of the mural. So as you can see, it's pretty massive. So this little purple thing over here it actually shows us where we are and what we're seeing on the on the entire mural. So this is pretty massive. So the way to zoom out is to actually either go with a minus, we can, we can click this one, or we can, it actually shows us in a little tooltip, we can do command minus or command plus. So I'm sure that, uh, you know, in any graphic uh, kind of design a tool, this capability is pretty kind of, you know, well, well used and kind of well-rounded everywhere. So a command minus or a control minus on, on the PC, 
allows you to zoom out and control plus allows you to zoom in. And as you can see, the thing itself uh, is pretty massive. So uh, I've zoomed out enough to actually see it. Uh, but if we would like to change the size of this entire mural, because if we double click anywhere now, it actually generates a, a, a yellow post-it note. So as you can see, it's pretty tiny because the mural is pretty massive. So again, I'm going to zoom in with a command plus just to get closer to this little post-it note. And the great thing about mural is that if you do a double click anywhere, it's going to generate a post-it note. So it's pretty quick and pretty easy to generate post-it notes. So to record any thoughts you might have when you're talking to people, when you're generating or kind of synthesizing any of the information that you get on a workshop. So, so it's a great way to actually put some notes together. And it's anytime I'm actually going to get rid of it with a delete uh, or a backspace uh, button. And um, the great thing about it in comparison with, I don't know, Envision or, or Google Jamboard is that when you double click it, it's already in your edit state. So all I need to do is double click and I'm already able to type. So I can type anything, right? And then I can click again, double click or on either side of it. And another great feature about Mural is that it actually aligns that post-it note uh, you know, to the top or to the to the side of the previous post-it note that you've actually put in. So, um, so it actually uh, aligns it together, right? So that's so that's a cool feature as well. Another cool thing. Um, I'm just gonna mute this thing. Uh, another cool thing about it is that if we change any setting of the mural, there's a little uh, a little kind of a pop up or or, or a kind of pop over uh, element here that allows us to edit features. Uh, or kind of elements of that of that of that specific post-it note, and that's relevant to any element on the actual mural um, itself. So if it's a post-it note, a shape, any other of those, you can actually edit that with this little pop-over. But before we get ahead of ourselves, um, I just wanted to cover the entire screen so that you understand what we're uh, what we're getting into. So we've covered the zoom feature on the right. So you can either go with a command minus or a command plus to to get to the bottom of you know, how zoomed in you are and how big the mural is in that context, right? So that's that's the first thing, pretty cool. Another thing is that if you do change any of those features of, of that element on the on the interface, uh, usually, not always, but usually, and I will test it out now, it actually keeps, if you now click again to the side of it, for example, it's gonna keep those, um, those, those kind of capabilities, right? So it's gonna, again, keep it red or keep it blue or keep it pink if you've chosen that specific color for that specific one. And also, Let's check it out. I think that if I do click on the left-hand side of this yellow one, it's going to actually maintain the yellow. So it kind of knows where we are on the on the mural itself, and it kind of helps without. So you don't have the the need to actually you know change those things um, on the go all the time, kind of edit them. So this helps if you know about it. You know you can actually work around the mural uh, a little bit more fast. You know kind of fastly um, or quickly. Uh, to, to make sure that you know that you use the capability as well. So that's that's something that I found very very useful. So getting rid of the post-it notes um, and we've covered the the zoom settings therefore and let's just cover the, the top bar now. Uh, uh, the top bar as I as I've mentioned the, the click to edit is the first element. So if you do a little drop down menu over here you can get to add it to favorites. You can share the mural. So if you click the share Another pop-up screen will, will, will kind of show up and you'll be able to actually invite some of the people that are in your network that already have Mural installed. You can obviously copy the link and send it over an email to, to, to a friend of yours who has a Mural as well. So this is kind of a feature to invite people over that have the Mural installed or kind of have, or, or, I don't know, paid subs, subscriptions of the actual uh, kind of solution. But if, uh, if, if, if you want to kind of invite someone anonymously, that doesn't use uh, Mural at all, for example, you can actually do an anonymous link, copy that one, and this is something I'll actually use in the second part of the webinar. I'll actually copy that link into the chat on the Zoom so you'll be able to actually have access to, uh, to the Mural and we'll just play around a little bit, do a little bit of a facilitation technique uh, together with all of you guys on the actual Mural. So in the second part of the webinar, I'll actually copy that into your, um, into your chat and you'll be able to do that. So. That's that. We can obviously export that stuff as PDF, PNG files, and um, you know all the links, images, etc. Uh, zip them together and send them over as well. So that's a pretty cool feature as well. Most most of the time, I actually use either the PDF or the PNG to have the entirety of the mural intact, and then just send it away as a kind of a, a archive or, or of some sort. So so that's that. Um, when it comes to to these features over there uh, and the entire top bar. 
we're going to get into that. But I just wanted to kind of ask you guys if whatever I've covered so far is understandable. All right, so the top bar. Uh, We've covered some of those elements, the, the mural settings and the, the exports, and, you know, and how to download the mural files, etc. And the second kind of the second section or the third section really is the mural settings and the mural members. I don't really cover the members themselves because we don't have any here, but the mural settings is pretty crucial. So this is where we get into the, the name, obviously, the background color. So we can ch change that from white to, um, you know, slight, really, really slight gray, a little bit darkish gray and a really dark gray. But from my experience, you know, having this a little bit lighter white so that the white post-it notes, if you do use them, uh, kind of, uh, they, they are a little bit more visible when they are placed on that than they are on the, on the white background. So I usually tend to use this one. Um, and then when it comes to the mural size, there's quite a few elements uh, available over here. And as a quick fix, it, they work. So you can actually uh, set the mural size to, you know, 1.x. And this is a real human being in comparison to the size of the mural. So you can actually kind of see the scale here. Now you can do it twice the size when it comes to kind of extending it horizontally. You can do it horizontally times three, et cetera, et cetera. And same goes for the verticals. But, um, and you can obviously set a custom size if you have, you want to be like pixel perfect. But there's a, another way of doing that with, that I wanted to show you. Um, and that's actually a little bit more, uh, a little bit easier for me. And, uh, and it kind of works more flexibly um, because all you need to do is kind of drag your mouse over to any size of the of the mural itself and then you can just kind of grab it and, and kind of you know drag around to make sure that you know the mural is, is sized according to your needs um, um, as, as, as you kind of expand it so you can actually go uh, right and you can go down right so you can use these two walls uh, and, the, and the left hand side no it's just the right and the bottom uh, wall that you can actually expand the mural by. So that's a pretty cool feature to have. So you don't have to kind of imagine how many pixels do I need to add to actually make this thing work, right? So that's that. Uh, so that's the mural settings that we've covered so far. This is what I use mostly. So if I run out of space, I just, you know, drag my mouse over the um, kind of the, the one of the sides of the mural and I just drag it to make it bigger. Uh, and the rest is like you can publish this, as a, publish this, uh, this mural as a template. You can duplicate it, obviously. So within the same room, it's going to duplicate it. So if I do duplicate it, it's going to create a copy. Obviously, you can name whatever that uh, copy uh, name is going to be. And which room do you want it to actually be in? So this is uh, a previous, web, previous web webinar room um, from the April 23rd. And we can definitely put it over there. So we can just do duplicate and off it goes. It's going to copy it and it's going to be moving us to that specific mural as well. So let's just stay in the copy uh, itself because we haven't really done anything to it yet. So we can actually do, do it and work with the copy itself. So that's that. And, you know, the rest I very rarely use. So this, these are the main features of this dropdown that I use. Then we go to these two elements. And as you can see, this little facilitator um, element shows me that I'm the facilitator of this specific mural. So I kind of run the show, right? And um, this is a pretty crucial um, element to have when, you, when you're actually working with it. And when I give you access to, to the mural itself, there will be kind of, um, I'll have a little bit more power uh, than anybody else on the mural. And I can actually manage that to some extent. So when it comes to the facilitator superpowers, it's uh, running the timer. I can, you know, make sure everybody is looking at the same thing. So I can kind of summon people together and I can outline some of the instructions, you know, et cetera. And I can super lock some of the elements and I can actually show that to you. But if there are some additional people on the mural itself, I can actually manage that and I can add superpowers to any members on the mural itself. So I can, we've got the facilitator over here. So if I have any friends that kind of have a subscription to mural, etc., or have a, a kind of a paid account, I have a membership. I can then give them the facil facilita facilitator powers and they will have the same powers as I have, right? So that's, that's that. And every time we go somewhere outside uh, or somewhere further into Mural, there's this uh, little um, dash on the left that kind of brings us back. So this is the back arrow that kind of takes us back to, to wherever we were previously. So that's the facilitator thing. Uh, this is kind of a status. So it kind of shows you that all changes have been saved. So this is a great thing of actually working with it, um, you know, remotely because everything is kind of being saved as you're working with it, right? So the, the possibility of, of losing it is pretty limited unless you actually get on it 
and um, yeah, you know, kind of delete something or by accident, and it's going to save that on top anyway. So, so that's kind of it's good when it works, right? So that's that's that. And then this brings me to these two icons, and the first one over here is a voting session. This is something we can get into when you're actually on the mural and we will run a voting session. And what it does is actually starts a voting session. All you need to do is click it. I can start a voting session. So let's imagine that there's like uh, a few post-it notes with something written on it. And let's imagine that this is option one. This is option two, right? This is option three and this is option four. Right. So if I have, you know, I don't know, 10, 50 people on the actual uh, mural itself, um, I can then, you know, allow them to vote on one of those options. And the way that I do it is I just do uh, I click the, this little icon here, the voting session. I start the voting session and a little pop up actually um, uh, shows itself and I can name this voting session. So we're uh, voting for options. And I can select the number of votes that I'm giving to the mural uh, participants. So I can do, you know, minus five. I can go, you know, how many votes I want to give to, to those participants. Let's say I'm going to give three. And I can then um, kind of de define who is able to end the, the voting session on, on this specific mural. Is it any member of this mural? Or is it just me and any of the facilitators that I've actually given the superpowers to, right? So I'm just going to leave it as just me and any other facilitators and go with the next. And that's when the voting starts. Everybody gets this little screen um, and it's uh, telling us that if you want to click, if you click a, any card on the, uh, on, the, on the mural, it's going to actually add a vote. If you do a shift and click, it's going to remove that vote. It's built specifically so that you can actually click many times on any card and your all of your votes will be counted towards that one card right so i can begin voting all of the voting is anonymous on mural also so if i click on option one and then i click again it's going to give my two votes to this one specific card which we, which is something we usually allow for when it comes uh, to this kind of voting and this is called dot voting and i get uh, a specific amount of dots to people and they can choose themselves how many dots they want to vote again, kind of with against any one of those options. So I can either, you know, click all and use up all of my three votes on this one option, or action I can I can kind of click on shift or, or 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 tap shift and then click on this again and it kind of disappears or takes that one vote out and I can then click on any other option and it kind of populates my votes this way, right? So it's a very useful option we use it very often uh, when we're doing these things. And as a facilitator, I've got this little window over here where I can end the voting session at any time. And also we have one person already voted. There's this little um, drop down menu that shows us that Andy Wojnarowski, I have zero votes left. So if you have more people on the actual mural, you're able to see all of them and see how many votes they have left. So you can actually wait, kind of push some people uh, towards, yeah, where's your vote, you know, make it happen. And on that basis, you can actually move a little bit, um, you know, closer to uh, to facilitation and kind of making sure that whatever is happening on the mural within your workshop actually is on time. So, so that's that. And if I kind of click off, you'll be able to see if I click off here and I do a drop down, I've got Andy Wojnarowski, two votes left, right? So it's constantly giving us live information about the status of that specific voting session, right? So this is a pretty powerful and pretty cool tool to have. So I'm going to vote any, any, in any way, shape or form. I'm going to go end voting session. Also, if I do, um, I think that if I don't use up all of those, it'll give me a, a result in accordance with however many votes I've given, right? So it doesn't kind of stop. You're the, you, you have the superpower, you finish the, the voting session, and it basically shows you the voting results for uh, that specific uh, voting session, which is called, we're voting for options, for example, right? So that's the results over there. And if you have multiple people, you'll be able to, to see the top voted uh, elements at the very top. This uh, and kind of prioritize from the most votes to the least votes. So that's that. All right. Is that understandable, guys, as far as the voting goes and some of the settings of the mural by the show of hands, thumbnails, kind of down, up, everything cool? All right. Awesome. Great to hear. How's their Facebook and YouTube going? Okay. No comments so far? Good. Well, not really good, you know. No questions so far, but... No comments? I don't know if that's that good. But we are moving on. 
Uh, so I'll leave these options on. Um, we can actually highlight them. Um, and kind of, we can see we, we're voting voting for it. We can see the results live over here, and then they're a little bit color coded over here. I can close these sub menus that that show show themselves in this little uh, in this little top bar uh, with this X, obviously. So I can close it, and then those elements that have been highlighted on the cards, as far as the voting goes, uh, are being uh, kind of you know not visible anymore. So that's that. So that's the voting feature, and that's very powerful and really helps. The second thing is the timer, which is another thing. I'm very compulsive when it comes to time management on a workshop itself. So it's pretty easy. You know, being the facilitator, you have the superpower, as, as, as it's mentioned here, of that timer, right? So you can do and set the time. So all I need to do is do, maybe let's do one minute or maybe let's do two minutes, right? So I can start the timer and then everybody sees that at the very top of, their, uh, of, the, of the bar. They can see that time running, uh, running out. And um, anytime I click on it, I can, as a facilitator, have additional options. So I can actually pause the timer, right? So it kind of stops and gives me a little bit, a little bit of a notification about that. I can resume the timer. And one cool feature is, you know, I can add one minute or five minutes, or I can end it at any time that I want. So this is pretty neat because um, sometimes when I give like three minutes for somebody to tell their story or to present something, you know, they're kind of, uh, going past that time, so I just you know very quickly just add one more minute to their to their time frame, so that they have this additional minute to actually you know close the close the the train of thought into something concrete, and then we can move on to the next person or to the next team. So that's uh, that's that. I'm going to end the timer, and that's pretty much it. So the one maybe unfortunate thing is something that I would really love for for this uh, feature to to have is kind of maybe something additional like a you know a bigger notification to the users that there's like 30 seconds left or left or something but you know the workaround around that is that I basically notify people that guys we've got one more minute to go uh, so kind of finish up uh, we're going to be moving on to the next uh, step in this uh, in this workshop so I'm kind of managing it uh, remotely that way right so I've got everybody on the zoom call and that way I can facilitate and kind of have be in constant con kind of con communication with the people on the on the call itself. All right, so that's the that's the timer. That's pretty easy to use. Uh, is that understandable, guys? By the show of a thumbs up, thumbs down. All right, cool. So that's uh, powerful, really easy to to manage, and that's pretty much it. All right, no worries. Uh, so we have the the share uh, button. Obviously, this is something we've already seen, right? So this is the the stuff that we are we were able to get access to through this little drop down over here. So share mural. That's exactly the same feature, right? It's just at the very top and really easy to access. And there's another thing in the export. Again, something that we have already seen in the in the dropdown of the of the mural settings, but with some additional features. You know, I've got some GitHub, Jira issues, etc. Uh, some specific, maybe more specific content. But again, to me, I usually use PDF, PNG files, and sometimes zip if it's a larger mural with some additional kind of photographs, images. I then just zip it together so I have it all in one package, right? So that's it. And then we have these options. I very rarely use them because I'm usually on the on the Zoom call with, with the participants. So we don't really use chat. Um, but it's a it's a capability nonetheless. So we can actually you know talk to each other over the chat. And um, and we can leave comments, which is it's a, it's an interesting feature. I rarely use it when I'm using Mural. I usually use different tools for kind of commenting on things, but Nonetheless, it's cool that they have it. So I can open up the actual comment uh, comment window. And uh, let me just see, I've opened it up so we can see the comments themselves, right? So we can actually, if anybody adds um, any, mm, any comments, so you can add new comments by doing a right click on the mural. So it's not kind of, it's not as easy to, to include those comments because you need to go like right click and then add comment and then this little window pops up on the right, you know, it, my comment uh, is here, right? And then you, you send it, and then it is on the right-hand side. I can close the window, obviously, and then I can, anytime I click on it, it's visible to other user participants, you'll be able to see it. And then it kind of pops over, or pops open this little window on the side, kind of an aside, uh, where you can actually see the comments over here. You can respond to it. Um, I agree. And you can see the history of how this comment came to be. You can see the number of comments or, or responses to the specific comments here. But it's a feature I rarely use for this specific thing. 
uh, when I'm doing workshops because I have people commenting on it uh, kind of um, live. But if you want to, to have an additional capability of using it and kind of giving it to, to people uh, you know, externally, remotely, so you kind of finish the session or you're working on something individually and then you send this over to the client, you can share the mural with them, show them how the comment uh, kind of feature works and then they can, they can just start commenting on it, right? And um, yeah, and, and you can, every time you, you get onto the mural, you can see those comments being put in place so they can communicate with you that way. But it's not kind of a, a very easy to use feature over here. Uh, it requires quite a few clicks and kind of getting used to. So, so that's that. Okay. So that's the comments. Then we go to the activity. So you can see these, these are kind of all of the activities on my session. So if I want to review what has been happening, uh, I can definitely kind of see the entire history of what has happened over this specific mural. So reply to a comment. The oldest um, elements are at the very bottom. And at the, at the very top, we can see that the most recent activities of any user on the actual mural. So for example, if somebody has commented on your design or, or any information you have on the mural, when you weren't here, for example, because you've shared the mural with them, you'll be able to see that whenever you um, kind of log back in. So you log back in, you can open up the activity window and you can see when that happened, like 11 minutes ago, you know, your client came in and left a comment, right? So you'll be able to have access to that history of whatever was happening and then you know be able to actually see what is happening reply and kind of be interactive with some of it and uh, not a lot of it is interactive but you know some of it is so if i'm for example zoomed away from that and i click option one it's going to zoom me uh, to, to to actually see that specific element so with huge massive murals this capability sometimes is sometimes is useful uh, because you can see that somebody has placed a comment and now you have a mural that's 25 meters wide and you, you don't really want to search for that at that scale. So you just click it over here and it drags you to that specific place immediately. So that's pretty cool. All right, last but not least is the left panel over here. This icon over here brings us back to the dashboard. So I go back to my all of my murals in my rooms. So that's that. And then this one is gonna open up another kind of um, segment of those, of those features. And we have, you know, we can input some text we can input say, a paragraph and we can input a kind of a, a comment itself. So kind of through a drag and drop rather than just right clicking and then adding a comment, we have the capability of dragging and dropping that stuff over here. But as you can see, sticky note, title, comment, and you know, an, an area is actually available from the right click on um, uh, underneath the right click of your mouse as well. So, so that's uh, that. And then again, we have you know, a way to drag and drop some of the post-it notes. They have they're either three by three, five by three, or they're circles, sticky notes, and you can drag and drop them pretty easily using that feature. Then we go to shapes and connect uh, and connectors. We have some shapes and we have some connectors. So if we use maybe, let's just maybe use this arrow and then try to connect it to, to, to one of those, these little kind of, um, you know, it kind of snaps in place. As you can see, it changes its color a little bit from like whitish into, you know, like a dark blue. And that means that it actually popped in place or snapped in place. And then whenever I kind of use this uh, or kind of drag and drop this uh, this little post-it note, it's going to keep that connection connected to, to that specific post-it note, which is pretty neat when you're kind of managing or, or mapping processes out, etc. And obviously, it keeps those links together, hopefully. Right, so if I connect it between like two different elements on the on the mural, I can you know drag and it still keeps those connections intact. So that's pretty cool. And then we have not post-it notes but actual shapes. Uh, we can actually you know, kind of uh, change their um, again their style, the way they look, but also the size itself. For post-it notes, you don't have that capability because it only is going to scale it, keeping the aspect ratio intact. Right, so it's either going to be a square. And I can only increase the size of the square. And same go, same goes for this rectangle uh, post-it note. I can only make it bigger or smaller. I can't really affect the ratio of those walls. But with the shapes, you have the capability of changing that into any any shape uh, uh, you want, right? So that's that. Then we have some icons. You can search those icons, and this actually would be a cool thing to have. Uh, like Jane mentioned, to search some of the mural members, maybe when you have a bigger mural. So that search feature would be cool to actually use over there as well. But um, for some reason, they, they, they didn't allow us to do that. So, you know, 
All we need to do is just do check and um, you can see a lot of uh, checkbox kind of icons here. The, the library is pretty vast, so I think that we, we, you'd be able to find enough of, of icons to, to, you know, to, to use for, for any kind of uh, capability or any, 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 any uh, kind of um, any works that you might be, might be having. Then we have the frameworks, which we've already kind of looked through. We have layouts, design, agile, etc. We can uh, import images uh, or search for images um, if they are uh, if there are any. And there's also we can import files from our computer, OneDrive, and Dropbox. And that's pretty much it. One additional feature is the, the ability to draw on your as well, which is pretty cool. So I can actually draw some shapes, you know, kind of uh, have a little bit of a capability to actually have like a um, you know a flip chart online, so I can highlight some stuff with the three different thicknesses. So I can do an ultra fine, I can do um, fine, and I can do medium, and I can also use a highlighter. So this is kind of a semi-transparent, so if I go with a red, I can actually highlight something with, with this specific element and then, then it works. And then I have a an eraser, so wherever I kind of click, it's going to disappear one of those lines, right? And that's pretty much it. So I just changed the color over here. This is the, the eraser and some of the highlighters and the size of the and the thickness of the lines. And once I'm done drawing, I do done drawing. And this is one of the biggest uh, limitations when it comes to mural. It's going to kind of save it as a uh, as an image or uh, as an overlay. And I cannot really edit it. So if I want to edit it, and I unfortunately have to kill it and then redraw it again. So that's um, pretty lim limited and. I rarely use it because of that specific thing. But if I do need to draw something, I can then use this feature. All right, guys, is that uh, understandable? So what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to do an anonymous link. I'm going to open up for um, for discussion as well. So if you guys have any questions, fire away. But I'm just going to go with uh, everyone in the meeting. There you go. So if you click on the actual link, you'll be able to have access to uh, to the mural itself. So let me just do that. I'm actually going to go to the Zoom a little bit and I'm going to unlock the meeting. Hopefully no, no crazy people will join us. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, some people just have a laugh, you know, and it's good. Let's have some laughs. Come on. So if you use the link, you'll be, you should be able to kind of get access to so as you can see, the the list uh, we have some uh, you know anonymous koalas and crabs and monkeys and you know uh, it kind of uh, generates a whole list of, of different animals with different colors as well. Uh, I haven't kind of uh, got to the to the end of that library of those animals, so it's uh, they they're pretty you know creative when it comes to that. And as you can see, there's a uh, you can basically you know put uh, your own post-it notes, change their colors, etc. Um, and yeah, just have, just have fun with it, you know, and just 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 um, just do that. So, so let's just do something, um, uh, something. And uh, what I wanted to do is maybe I'll take one of the one of the titles, maybe, and let's build a design thinking process as as, as I kind of understand it. So I'm just gonna drag and drop a title over here, um, and I'm gonna do a design thinking process. And one cool feature is if you click on my, uh, at the very bottom of the screen, you've got all the animals and you've got me as the facilitator. It's like, it starts with an A, it's, it's my, you know, my, uh, my initial. So if you click on that, you're actually able to, uh, to either follow me, so I can actually ask you guys to follow me, right? Or I can actually summon you to whatever I'm looking at. So when I do summon you as a facilitator, you're gonna be dragged to, uh, you know, to whatever I'm working on. And this is a pretty powerful thing. Obviously, you're not kind of locked into that. You can click off and, and do whatever you want, but it kind of helps the facilitator with a huge mural when people kind of, you know, kind of move around it to summon people to, to kind of see uh, what, you're, what you're working on. And I can also broadcast my cursor or not. I usually have this turned on so that whenever I am kind of flying around something, like I'm kind of, um, you know, flying around the middle, you, you're, you're able to see... Uh, you know, Andy and 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 my name, etc. So, so that's that. I'm gonna zoom out, move a little bit to the side, and yeah, and just try to do a little bit of a design over here. So the design thinking process itself, uh, I'm gonna call it the new way. And 
Another cool feature when it comes to Mural is you can actually change the, the fonts themselves and kind of edit those elements as well. So um, we have this popover element that we can get access to whenever we are actually working on it. And um, uh, yeah, we can increase the size. We've got the, the minus and the plus, obviously, and we can increase or decrease the size of the font. So we can do it pretty easily, right? So we can do that. But the cool thing is that we have a list of uh, kind of, um, of, 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 of pre-existing fonts in Mural that can uh, increase the readability and kind of more make it more of a fun factor um, when it comes to using of it. So I'm going to use my favorite one, which is called Marker Felt. And it kind of gives this, uh, you know, impression of being written. Uh, I wish I had this kind of, a, you know, uh, this kind of a character when it comes to, to drawing and writing. It's beautiful. Uh, I, I unfortunately don't have that. So we can increase the, the size of this font. We can definitely change the, um, the, the style of it with the font typeface, as well as, you know, making it um, italic, underline it, or, you know, cross over that and align it into some way, shape, or form um, as well. So that's pretty neat to do. Uh, but uh, let's just move on. So, so the way that I usually structure these things when I'm designing something uh, together with someone or when I'm putting together a canvas for people to design on, there's a few things I do. I create those sections of the exercise. So I kind of highlight, okay, this is the um, design thinking process, and I'm going to show it step number one. Right, so I always highlight and kind of keep a structure of elements for the people to understand. We have a, a certain amount of steps to go through within our uh, kind of working together on this specific mural. There's one trick that I would um, that I would put out there for you guys as well when it comes to typography. We've covered some of the typographical elements with Jane on our last webinar, and what I learned a lot through the coding of the Microsoft Word. But there is one cool thing that I would uh, kind of uh, show you, I'm going to summon you to, to, to me so you can see what I'm working on. And usually what people do when they kind of want to make things more pronounced on the interface when it comes to typography, they make them bold, right? What, and that's just changing one thing uh, when it comes to the, to, to, the, to the typeface. So I'm going to change the font maybe to something like Proxima Nova to illustrate that uh, the thing. So if I want to make this design thinking process more pronounced, I just do make it bold, right? And that's just one thing that we've changed and the size as well. So this already is, is pretty much enough, right? So, so, so the kind of the tip that I would give you when it comes to putting two elements of the typography on the interface visually so people uh, understand it and um, it's pleasing from, so from some aesthetical aspect, use at least two elements of differentiation. So either use the boldness of the font and the size, or you can use uh, the size of the fonts and the color. These are the two elements I use usually, uh, either size and boldness or size and color. So I'm going to go back to my favorite font. I've changed to this one specifically because for Marker Felt, you cannot make it bold. It's the way it is and that's it, right? So you can only affect the size, the color, and you can, you know, do like uh, maybe italic, etc. So I usually use this one. And then what I need to do is we're differentiated only by size, so I usually change the color and I just use this font color and I do it like, you know, light gray, for example. And just through doing that, just using one additional color uh, and a little bit of different or, or shift in size, I can actually, um, you know, make it more visually pleasing to some, um, to the participants. So that's step number one. And then I just fire away with, uh, the, uh, with the design itself. So what I'm going to do is show you um, how I structure the, the tool itself to make it as usable and as facilitator uh, kind of prone as, as, uh, as it can be. I, what I do is I, I first take a post-it note just to get a, a sizing kind of, um, so I know what, what size uh, the, the post-it note is when I actually drag and drop it onto the canvas. So I'm just going to go and summon you guys here. Uh, so this is pretty, uh, pretty good, um, something that really works for me well. So I put a, um, a post-it note on the canvas. So I know what, what is the size of a standard size of the post-it note. And then I go to the shapes and connectors and I take an empty shape, which basically shows us a little bit of a frame. It's exactly the same size as the post-it note. So what I do is I increase that very slightly, keeping it square. If you want to keep something uh, with the same aspect ratio, all you need to do is just hold down shift and it's going to kind of lock in place. So if I release shift, 
I can do whatever I want with it. But if I uh, click shift, it's actually going to keep the, the, the aspect ratio intact, right? So I click the shift, and what I do is I create these little, little frames for the participants to use. So they kind of fit the post-it note perfectly. So what I do is I allow for the guys to actually, I give them the room to play with, right? So I do, I probably increase the, the, the size of that, uh, of, the, of the frame itself. I change its color a little bit because it's, you know, black and I don't need it to be that black. And then if this is step number one of an exercise that I'm putting together and I would like them to uh, maybe, I don't know, generate, uh, let's say, seven ideas, right? I put in seven frames, right? I can then highlight all of those frames. A little pop over again shows up and there's a little icon which uh, says align on it. And I just do align. I distribute them horizontally so that they're nice and, uh, and neat. I put them, because I've, these are the ones that I've put later than the post-it note, I do a right click and I can send them to back so that they're at the very back of the interface or at the very back of the mural. So they can form the backbone of the, of the structure. And then all I need to do is lock them in place so that uh, they're not, only, only I as a facilitator can actually unlock them and then move them around. So what I do is I highlight all those elements, I right click on them, I lock them, and as you can see, there's a little kind of a pop over again or a, a pop up screen that shows us any member can unlock or only facilitators can unlock. And that's something I do. So I, I, I give only the facilitator the power to unlock elements. So only facilitators can unlock. So I click that. And now, as you can see, guys, you won't be able, and I cannot do that either. You, you're not able to move those gray, um, those gray, um, you know, frames that we've just put together, right? So you can't really move those. And that's what I want, because now if I give the participants an exercise of, okay, design thinking process, step number one is let's generate seven ideas about how to tackle something. I give them seven frames to do that. So whenever I click or you know, double click, these uh, post-it notes fit perfectly. And this allows me to manage and kind of, um, you know, uh, create this little bit of a you know a psychological motivation for people to actually generate uh, and have the appropriate amount of room to actually put the post-it notes in those. And I've seen it so many times. Just because I've put those frames together, the the structure information is more um, you know organized, and I manage that organization. So um, it's uh, it's a lot easier to read it because if I didn't have those frames and I would just tell anybody, okay, generate seven ideas, they would go. One, you know, two, three, four, uh, five, um, you know, six, and seven. And then, you know, times five people, there's a lot of mess being created on the interface or on the actual mural itself. So through the, you know, this uh, kind of capability of putting those frames and then locking them in place, we're able to manage the structure of our mural a little bit more. And I've seen so many people actually, when they see the frames, they kind of, you know, go and even if they uh, if they stick the post-it note and it's not aligned with the frame, every time I see them like, yeah, I just want to nudge it a little bit so that it neatly kind of aligns with it. Yeah, absolutely. No worries. You can lock any element as a facilitator or a member. All you need to do is just right click on any element on the screen and a little show and there is a lock uh, icon and a lock word, obviously. Uh, and you can uh, lock it in two kind of options, either so that any member can unlock. So I'm going to lock this one so that anybody of you can unlock. And it's locked, right? So I cannot really highlight it. And there are two ways of unlocking it. So I can actually either right click this specific element and unlock it, right? Um, it's difficult to, 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 to kind of shape, uh, kind of separate them out automatically. It's a uh, uh, that's why it's good to actually lock some elements in place. So when you do put something on top of them and you kind of try to drag elements on top of it, you're not highlighting anything underneath. And that's, that's something that's pretty crucial as well. Sometimes when we are running a workshop, I'm going to zoom out over here. Um, the way that, that we do it, you know, we lock elements in place because uh, we then highlight whatever the, the participants put together and we sometimes move it. You know, we just move it to the next part of the tool, to the next step of the tool, for example. And we just want to leave these 
you know everything behind we just want the the information to be moved not the structure of the of the of the mural itself or structure of the canvas so that's something that we kind of make sure that we have locked and put in place before we actually invite people over uh, so that we kind of manage the, the structure of the, of, of the canvas itself, right? So that's, mm, that's that, right? Is that kind of understandable, guys? By the show of hands, thumbnails, thumbs up. Awesome. Right, so that's, that's the first thing that, that is pretty crucial when it comes to sharing a mural with, um, you know, with, with the participants. So locking things in place, uh, making sure that you put that structure together and then lock it so that you can obviously as a facilitator unlock that thing but no nobody else uh, can do that um, uh, but you so that's one thing another thing uh, it's like nine o'clock so i need to wrap it up uh, i mean i'm good to go but uh, i just don't want to, to to bore you too much guys unless there are questions um so another thing that is really crucial when it comes to running these things remotely is time management and Let's just break it down into an example. What I'm going to do is right click and I'm going to unlock everything because I want these um, and it's going to make sure kind of, are you sure that you want to unlock everything? And I'm going to go unlock all elements. So anything that you've locked or, I, or I've locked is now unlocked. And what I want to do is kind of create a maybe two step process of this whole thing. So I'm going to go, uh, if you hold down the option key on the Mac and kind of highlight the elements and then hold down the option key and then drag and drop it, kind of click and drag, you're able to, to, to kind of copy those elements uh, and move them at the same time, right? So I'm gonna kind of do that uh, a few times just to have a few steps, like step number one, step number one, and then step number uh, one. Uh, so I'm just gonna summon you guys uh, to me so you'll be able to, to, to see what I'm doing. So. We have step number one. I'm gonna double click on step number one and kind of change it into step number two. We double click on this one and I'm gonna change that to step number three. Okay, what do we need to do now, guys? Is, you've guessed it, we need to do what? We need to lock it so that only facilitators can unlock it, right? So I'm gonna highlight everything, right click, and I'm going to lock those in place. So now I've copied it, edited it, and, and kind of put a structure in place so that users can use it, right? And now we have three steps to follow and that's where whole time management thing kicks in. I've seen so many things, uh, so many canvases. Actually, we're gonna do it with a, with a template. Uh, let's maybe go with this template that, that somebody put in here. So we've got the persona document, for example, right? So let's imagine that this persona document um, is something that we would like the participants on our workshop to fill out, right? We want them to uh, name and sketch. We would like to kind of name some behaviors and actions and some demographic and psychographic and, and needs pain and needs and pain points, right? These are like four different elements of this specific Canva. Uh, we need to lock it in place, obviously. That's the first thing that I'm gonna do. So that only facilities can kind of lock it. And that's the first thing. So we're done, we're, we've locked it. The second one is time management. And every time I work with any Canva, I always break it down. So we have a persona document here and it has specific, very distinct four areas. So it's got the name and sketch, behaviors and actions, needs and pain points and demographic information, right? So I already can tell that I need four, um, four time frames to fill this out. So I don't want to give this entire canvas to people and just go hooray, off you go and just have fun with it and let's just manage the hour. If I have one hour and I would like you to fill, fill it out, what I'm going to do is I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to uh, add, let me just go with a text. First thing I do then is, okay, I have one hour to, 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 to do this workshop. I've got this canvas to work with. There are four elements that I see that I want people to fill out. 60 minutes are in the hour. Uh, I want to use it properly, I'm gonna subdivide the 60 minutes into four because there's four elements on that specific canvas which gives me four times 15, right? So four times 15 minutes equals 60 minutes. So it's pretty basic math, but it's very crucial so that we know how many minutes do we have for people to actually figure this thing out, right? So we have four times 15, that's equal to, to, to 60 minutes, right? So that's one hour worth of work and that's what we're going to do, right? So we have 15 minutes, 
to run on the name and sketch. Uh, I, we have 50 minutes to run on the behaviors and actions. We have 50 minutes to run on the needs and, and pain points, for example, and we have 50 minutes to do the demographical information, right? Sounds pretty easy. Is that kind of understandable, guys? How to, the first step into time management on the remote workshops is to make sure, or any workshops really, is to break down your tool, whatever that tool is, into sections that you're gonna be running it, um, running it separately as far as time management goes. And that's very crucial. You know, I'm pretty anal when it comes to time management on these things, but people usually tend to leave five minutes before time. Uh, thanks to that. So that's really crucial. That's the first thing. So I know that I need, I, I only have 50 minutes to cover each one of those areas. So that's step number one. Step number two is counting how many participants you have. So let's imagine we have how many people? Uh, let me just summon everyone. We have nine people uh, working with us today, right? So I'm going to copy uh, this text here. And we have nine people. So let's imagine that we're running a workshop for nine people remotely and we only have an hour to do this tool. So we know that's 15 times four, that's one thing. But then 50 minutes is for describing what we need to do with that specific name and sketch. 50 minutes is there for us to allow people to work on it. And then 50 minutes is there for us to actually synthesize that information somehow, right? And there is nine people doing it. so. We have nine people doing it, and as, as I mentioned, there are three phases to this whole thing. So, three phases. And phase number one, I'm just going to go like semicolon. Phase number one is intro. So, I need to tell people what I'm expecting them to fill into that specific space so that they understand what I mean. Second one is the work. All right, so that's the second one. So, that's uh, two dash. And the third one is some sort of a presentation or a synthesis or a synthesis. So that's, so that's that. So two, one, and three. And usually 95% of the workshop facilitators forget about that. I mean, I've been working with a lot of, uh, you know, designers, um, people that, um, yeah, do these things professionally, etc. And that was one of the craziest thing for me that they don't subdivide their tools into those chunks and those chunks into further chunks, you know, because when you look at my kind of agenda for a workshop, I'm down to, uh, you know, a single minutes when I'm running a, an exercise like this. So a simple persona document built of four sections for nine people, to me, it's not simple for sections and it's not simply uh, 60 minutes. So I break it down four times 15. And then out of this four 50 minutes, I have now 50 minutes and I have three phases to cover within those uh, 15 minutes. So I want to have probably, let's say what, about two minutes to do the intro so I can tell everybody, um, you know, what it's all about, what I'm expecting them to do. I give them probably around, you know, maybe, maybe 10 minutes to work with it or something like that, right? The work. And I give them the remaining three minutes to present. And that is, guys, crucial because out of the hour that we have for the workshop, we only have 40 minutes to work with the tool. And understanding that simple mechanic is, is, is very crucial to run and facilitate the workshops efficiently. So every time you have a tool, break it down into simpler chunks so that you know what you're managing. And then those chunks into intro, work, present. And now, what did I, why did I say about the nine people? Because if we have nine people on the workshop and we would like everybody to have a, a say in the workshop, three minutes to present is not enough for nine people, unless we do maybe, you know, 20 seconds per person, which is impossible for anybody to say anything within 20 seconds. So again, nine people, and it's a simple math again. So at least I give at least two to three minutes per person to synthesize their thoughts and you know, kind of present their way of looking at something, right? So immediately with nine people, that's 20 minutes gone. If you want everybody to have a say, and you have nine people running it, 20 minutes have just disappeared. So these are the elements that I consistently think about when I design these workshops and put them together. So I start with, uh, to summarize, start with the time frame and the tool, break it down 
and break it down even further and think about how many participants you have and if you want everybody to have a say. That's pretty much the synthesis uh, of this whole thing. Is that understandable, guys? The, the way to structure and facilitate as far as the management of time goes? Is that cool? So I'll just follow up with kind of the, the usage of those specific tools, specifically the timer, just to finish up the time management. So once I do have all of the minutes aligned and I, do, and I know exactly how much time I have, I can then use the timer and I use it excessively. So I go like, okay, we will have now seven minutes to work with it. So I just set the timer to seven minutes and off it goes. And this is everything that I'm managing for the entire hour. So I know exactly what is the structure of the tool, which specific steps I'm going to be going to. I'm giving myself enough time to present an introduction to what we're going to be doing for each one of those chunks. And then I just manage it. And I just, you know, it's a, it's a stopwatch exercise and that's pretty much it. So when you just structure it in minutes, I can promise you that you'll be able to, to figure these things out very quickly and have that done in time. And just through doing that, guys, you'll be uh, leaps ahead of many of, uh, you know, current design thinkers and uh, facilitators um, because they kind of wing it, <laughs> you know? A lot of people kind of just wing it. And then it's we are an hour in, uh, the client is pissed off because we were supposed to do something here, we were supposed to end with a result, and all you do is you're, you know, you, you, you're kind of, okay, so let's just cover this particular element on our next meeting. And then instead of having one meeting, you have 20. Uh, and that's bad, <laughs> specifically for our remote work. Um, so definitely something I would highly recommend to do with everything you do on, on, an, on an online workshop or any other workshop to manage your time properly, subdivide those things into simple math and then just run with it. And it's pretty easy to do uh, with those simple rules. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. So um, open to questions, comments, uh, remarks. There you go. So we have the design thinking. And the question is, how do we run uh, multiple inputs? So basically multiple people giving the information or kind of putting the information on Mural itself. So this kind of, uh, it's a great question. Um, the way that I usually uh, do that is through the, the main understanding of, of running this, this remote workshop, that there are two phases of working with the tool uh, or, or any other workshop. It's individual work and then synthesis or presentation, which is pretty much group work. Or to highlight it even, even better, it's, I'm actually going to do it in, um, in with some post-it notes. Uh, let's just do maybe blue ones. So the, there are three steps to it. The first one, I always use this one, is it's individual, individual mode, I'm going to call this. Uh, then we go into uh, presentation mode, and then we go to a synthesis mode. All right? And when it comes to... Um, who's doing what or, or what is the kind of the, the impact this is um, um like this is individual obviously individual the presentation mode is also individual and the synthesis mode is group work to me right so i depending on how many people i have on the workshop i provide enough individual rooms for them to work on. So let's imagine we have design thinking process as a, as a you know, as, as something that I would like people to actually work with. So let's just name it, maybe not design thinking process, but let's just say, um, generate uh, seven ideas. So copy that, all right. And I give a space for the crab. It usually not, is not the crab, it usually, you know, is, is let's call him Steve and Mary. So I invite people that I know, uh, you know, that are going to be participating. So I, I don't know what kind of um, animal they're going to get. So I, I give them spaces specific to their kind of names or roles in the company, etc. But I usually say this is Steve's um, part of the canvas and this is Mary's, right? So I then tell everybody, okay, hi, Steve. Hi, Mary. First of all, I would like you to individually generate uh, seven ideas on a subject matter, right? So they do... Uh, and I give them an appropriate amount of time because I've calculated how many minutes every person has, etc. right? I'm just gonna, I just bear with you, I'm just gonna open up the chat so I see if, if anybody's writing something. Um, and they do that, right? So they generate, Steve does that, 
I give them three minutes. Steve does their, his, uh, his seven um, ideas and Mary probably using a different color. So I kind of uh, push people to use different colors for themselves. So let's say that Mary is going to be pink. You know, this is so stereotypical, man. <laughs> that Mary's pink and Steve is blue. It's like boy and girl colors, man. We're going to change that. Let's not be as stereotypical as that. Let's just do Mary's going to have a black color. Yes. A very VIP professional, like, you know, yes, hardcore. Um, and I, I'm just joking, guys, obviously. So I give Steve and Mary two different parts of the canvas to fill out the information. And they do it individually first. I give them three minutes or something. So I manage their time. Then, and that's kind of, that's the individual mode done, right? So I know that they've generated, synthesized their thoughts individually. Then I give Steve or Mary, I give both of them the appropriate amount of time to present either all of their ideas or, or everything that they've been working on so far or the best ones that they think are presentable, right? So I give Steve, let's say five minutes. Okay, Steve, uh, please tell me, um, about three of your best ideas and Steve chooses one, two and three and he presents those and then I give Mary the opportunity to do the same and I'm okay Mary you have now you have three three minutes to to present to the group your best three ideas so depending on how many people there are in the workshop that's how many times I'm gonna have to multiply the amount of presentation time so if I have five people times three minutes that's 50 minutes that I kind of I wouldn't say waste but I, I commit to the presentation plus three minutes to work individually. So I'm gonna do our little math again. I'm gonna do this and change the color to maybe let's do pink and then let's change the color for the time themselves into, uh, I don't know, green. So I give them three minutes. So everybody wor works in parallel. So it's just three minutes. Then presents, so it's three times, let's say five people, which is equal to now 15 minutes right and then everybody out of those five people knows what are the best ideas generated by the entire group because they have been presented right so usually i do provide an area on the canvas for steve for mary and for everybody else to choose that for themselves so steve is presenting his three best ideas right and i do that and i go Okay, oh, come on. So I go best ideas for Steve and the best ideas for Mary as well. All right, so they get, again, their own little section where they have the room to choose that. So when they're presenting stuff, they have a structure of the presentation given by me as well. So they're like, this is my favorite idea, blah, 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 blah. This is another one, and this is another cool idea. I would probably give them frames so that they actually put those three ideas into those three frames. Mary does the same thing, and so do the other participants of the workshop. So now we have five participants, and we have 15 ideas that have been chosen and presented to the group. So everybody has a good understanding of what those ideas are, right? And that's when we're done with the individual presentation mode. So we've committed 15 minutes, everybody's knowledge is at the same level now. So everybody heard about the best ideas out of the five people. And that's when I get into the synthesis mode and that's when I run a voting session. So the group uh, exercise is all about the voting session. So let's imagine that we're the participants, Steve and Mary are here and they've presented. And let's do a quick voting session, guys, together. Let me just change this one to Mary. And I'm going to run a voting session. I'm going to give how many votes. Uh, there's another equation that I would always use to, um, to kind of have the, the votes uh, or, or kind of highlight how many votes I give. And that's usually, uh, if I have, let's imagine that we have six ideas over here, right? So we have three of Steve's and three of Mary's. And that's what we're going to be voting, voting on. So on that basis, I pretty much give everybody three votes, right? And that's what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to give all of you guys, including me as well, three votes. And we're going to call this voting session idea um, priorities. And I'm going to do next. And you can begin voting. So let's just do the votes. Uh, so you can click around the mural, guys. 
I can see obviously how many votes are left. I know that Anonymous Snake has already voted and I know that Anonymous Elephant has already voted once. Uh, I haven't voted yet, etc. So I am going to vote one, two and three. And as you can see on the drop down, I can see whoever has voted and whoever has not voted yet. So as a facilitator, I can actually kind of do a shout out. Hey guys, where's the panda and snail and cat and snake? Where are your votes? Um, so I can give the people to the opportunity to get on it and, uh, and do the voting. Or I can basically say that, okay, uh, time's up guys. And we're going to end the voting session. I'm going to give the snail the opportunity because they just... Uh, it's a snail, you know, it's a little bit slowish sometimes, you know, <laughs> as a snail. You get it, right? Um, so there are some votes left and I'm just going to go end voting session. End session for everyone. And these are the results. So we can see that there were unique four voters and there were six votes given to this specific idea. There were three votes to these ones, two votes to these ones. So we have a list, a kind of a result of the voting session. So we can close it. And we can see which one of those post-it notes is the voted, the highest voted ones. And that's where I move on to another stretch of, um, of, the, of the canvas that I obviously have pre-made, right? So I just go chosen ideas. Uh, chosen ideas. That's what I do. And that's like uh, max five, right? And I give that obviously enough room to fit those five post-it notes. And I just go, okay, this is six votes, three votes, uh, two votes. So I just drag and drop this thing, uh, another two votes. And then there is, you know, two, the, the final two ideas are with, with one vote, right? So in this specific case, I would either open up for discussion, like openly, hey guys, what do you think? And if there is too much of a discussion, I time that. I'm like, okay, I'm going to give them 60 seconds to come up with a result, to vote which one is better, which one do we choose. If they don't come up with a discussion, I do another voting session just on these two uh, post-it notes, right? And then I'm able to move the, the fifth one to the chosen ideas. And that's how I kind of remotely synthesize the discussion uh, into something that, um, yeah, that, that's workable, right? And we just move on from step uh, step one to two, three, etc. Sometimes it's difficult with some more diverse kind of um, tools, but again, guys, if you, any tool can be broken down into simpler chunks. It's like, I cannot stress this enough, you know, because it's really easy to kind of, you know, let people flow and have fun, etc. It's a lot more difficult to actually, you know, structure it so that people know exactly how much time they have and you as a facilitator you know exactly the result that you're expecting and um that's you know i can't stress enough it's really it's really important to have that subdivision of minutes and the task tasks within those minutes and i promise you if you do that not only you'll be one of the best facilitators out there through just that uh, but also you know you'll be able to finish any meeting before time and having people kind of satisfy that wow we've actually got somewhere you know we've actually done something here and yeah and we've got five minutes to spare to do some you know q a so that's pretty crucial